Three for 2024 was One, No One and 100,000, written by Luigi Pirandello, and this is a modern translation version by Kevin Hauser. So I finished this book about a week or two ago, and I think given how much I've highlighted throughout the book, it's kind of a testament to everything that I got out of it. So I would recommend this book. However, I did give it a three stars because the actual prose of the book is not that interesting, but the way that it is written allows you to understand the kind of existential philosophy that Perandello is trying to communicate. So I loved it for the existential, said it right this time, um, kind of underlying philosophy that's in it, but the actual prose itself wasn't, you know, amazing. So essentially, Perandello is questioning the very nature of the self and reality and um, how we've all got different realities. And he does this through the perspective of a man who appears to be losing his mind. But the irony of the story is that he is actually the most sane person in the book who's discovered these things about himself that everybody would, you know, discover about themselves if they took the time to think about them. And it was interesting as well when I first started reading the book because I'd written, written I'd read the kind of like, is it four word? Let's cut all this. Let's just see what it says in here. Oh, it just says like a little bit about him briefly in the beginning. And it comments a little bit about his relationship with his wife. I know his wife um, went mad or was demonstrating behaviours of madness. And some of that is made reference to in the book, which I wouldn't have picked up on if I hadn't read that autobiographical background before. And there's also a little bit about career choices. And it was interesting because it, it was, you know, I imagine what Perandello was thinking about his own kind of career choices because they differed so much from his father's perspective on what they should have been. I'll revisit that, you know, as we kind of go through it. Um, in fact, just as an example of that, it would be he talks a little bit about how when he thinks about the people that he grew up with, that they all at some point attached a car to themselves, as in like they chose a career. And once that car's on you, you're kind of stuck going in one direction because, you know, the, the metaphor of cars, you can't really change directions. You can just kind of go in a straight line. And he was saying that once that car's attached to you, you've got no kind of freedom and you, you're kind of stuck on that, but you do have direction. Whereas the opposite to that is kind of having no car and having no kind of aim and direction, but having lots of open options. And it was interesting because that alluded to him being a writer and having no fixed kind of career because he might have been trying to you know different things. But that other people that were his age were picking a career and were stuck to it, but weren't necessarily any happier. And just kind of, you know, making a comparison between those two life choices, because obviously his father was very much against him being a writer. So I found that that was quite interesting that he made reference to that. And the story begins quite comically, like there's a lot of humour interspersed between, you know, throughout the book to kind of give it a light feel, even though it's quite a heavy topic and concept that's being discussed so there's a, there's a nice juxtaposition between that and, you know it's not it's not depressing but then it is a little bit but it's got that, that comic relief in it to kind of make it not as depressing because as I discuss it you'll you'll understand what I mean by it being a heavy concept um, he comes to this realization that how he's perceived himself his whole life is not how others perceive him in the sense of he talks about having like a crooked nose. I think it's him. Or he, I think it is just he describes somebody else having a crooked nose. I think it's him. And he's never had this realisation before. And he talks about his eyebrows being a certain shape as well. And it's like never occurred to him. But yet everybody else around him has had the awareness that that's what he looks like. And he has this self-concept of himself that he's an attractive 
you know what I think he calls himself like a, an averagely attractive man but we all know that the concept of averagely attractive means that we think that we're okay looking and I suppose that is the reality of you know average looking is probably relatively attractive and so he's, he's always thought of himself like that but when he discovers all these things about himself it makes him really really self-conscious because then he's questioning how people are perceiving him and how that's different to how he's perceiving himself I thought that was quite interesting because I find that if I don't look at myself in a mirror and I don't kind of look at kind of what I look like or think about what I look like I'm very self-confident and think that I'm really attractive but then when you actually hyperanalyze your face and things like that you discover that actually maybe you're not um and then that affects how you are in the world so I thought that was quite interesting because you know where does this kind of some people have a lot of self-consciousness -con where does that come from you know when I think back to when I was at school people would point things out about you that you hadn't even noticed I remember actually I was in PE when I was having PE uh, it was it was gymnast not gymnast it, we were in the gym and you know when you get all the um the, the equipment out in the 80s like the wooden structure that only came out once a year and you could climb over it and things like that and do like you know moves through it um we were, we were you know that equipment was out and we were running around I think as a warm-up and somebody pointed out that I had a really big big toe um <laughs> And I was like, what? Like, it's a normal size big toe. But in comparison to her toe, it was relatively big because she had quite a small big toe. So who had a smaller one or a bigger one? It's not important, but we had a different sized big toe. And because mine was bigger than her, she pointed out that it was really big. And I became really self-conscious about my toes for a long time. Um, so, you know, it was, it was, you know, making me reminisce about that, really. Um and there's also a kind of comment about how we're, we very easily point out the flaws of other people, but we don't often recognise them in ourselves. So that kind of self-concept is not reality. It's our own constructed reality. And then this kind of awareness kind of catalyzes um, Oscarda, the main character, to explore this concept of the self. And to explore this idea of we're kind of stuck in our bodies you know we didn't choose to have these bodies and we've inherited lots of traits from our parents who were also stuck in their bodies and they inherited them and it, it's kind of like you you know I remember being younger and, and being really kind of annoyed at the fact that my mother and father had given me certain traits but they're also stuck with them and you know to be stuck in this body and to then not have you know, why did you end up in this body? Why is this you? It's interesting, actually, because the, the way that this book explores the self is there is this kind of separation from the body as being a different self to the person that's inside. And it's interesting because, for me, my self does sit inside my body. So my body's not really me, but my body is me. And unless you kind of explore that, you know, like you think, like, this is, they are, well, no, that this is me as well. But it's an interesting kind of concept to, to explore and think about. Um, and per, um, I'm going to think about how to pronounce his name. Pirandello is kind of, you know, getting you to think about that. So it, it was really interesting for me. Um, so we've got this kind of dichotomy of self. We've got the body self and we've got the kind of being that's inside that we consider ourselves to be. So this distinction's made as Moscada is ruminating and, and pontificating about the concept of the self. Pirandello does it really, really well so that it sounds like someone, the, the character is just musing about things and exploring different things, but it's not boring and it's not, you know, some philosophy that you read is really boring, but this is done in a fictitious prose kind of way. So it's really, really accessible to get you, you thinking about these things. There's also a comment about how with this dichotomy of self where you've got the body and you've got the bit inside, the being inside can't really observe what the body is like because you can never see yourself. Like you're looking out, but you don't see yourself. And this, I imagine this was written before the days of, of you know, video. But there's a comment about photographs and how, what is it photographs? Maybe it's not even commented on that. There was a comment about not being able to see yourself live. 
and it, it actually talks about reflections as you like walk past a door, shop front or whatever, and how there's a split second where you see the real body self, but as soon as you notice that it's you and not somebody else, it disappears because it's almost like you're a, a deer in headlights and you know that you're looking at yourself and you change. And it's a bit like when someone takes a photograph of you and you pause and you're not alive anymore. You're not kind of how you are animated in reality. You are very static. And it's interesting because if you watch somebody on a video, is that they're a live being? Because a lot of people act on videos and they're not actually how they would be if they were interacting with a person or if they were on their own. It's a very different version of, of who that, that self is. And so that was interesting. Like, how do you get the perspective of others on yourself if you can only ever view yourself in a way that's artificial? So that was explored really well as well. And there's a few comments that Moscardo says about how when he's referring to the experience of the body self that he just goes about life and doesn't really have any awareness of what he's doing or why he's doing it and he doesn't really know anything about himself um I'm trying to find the quote didn't know anything about himself uh, he's living in the moment and not realizing that he's alive and this made me think about there's like a common midlife realization that you have when you get to a certain age maybe like 30 where you look at your life and you think I've been on autopilot for a long time and I've just been working through my to-do lists and doing all the things that I need to do all the kind of things that have been um, imposed on me externally and you kind of get to the point where you're like who who am I like who is this person who's gone so long and changed so much and you kind of lose like that internal being self and you don't recognize it anymore and you know you need that introspection to kind of figure out like what are you doing what's your life about you know what are your plans where are you going that kind of thing when Pirandello explores the nature of each person's reality and almost this feeling of being unseen by others as they only ever see your body self and they don't see the being that's inside and you know it's interesting to me that because I often feel unseen by people and I think my external often doesn't reflect my internal and there's a lot of people that perceive me in ways that I, that don't seem to be my reality of my internalness and anybody that gets close to me wouldn't share that perception of me but then this is what the book's all about everyone's got their own personal perceptions of things and it was interesting because Pirandello uses really quite crass descriptions of the women and children that are in uh, Moscardo's yard Moscardo's yard sorry not Moscardo and he, he uses words like, um, he describes this woman as being like filthy and, and um, like horrific and says she's got a horrific tit that's hanging out and uh, says that the baby that she's holding has got a disgusting case of kit, cradle uh, cap. It's very visceral, very kind of, like it makes you feel a bit ill as you are reading it. And it was very interesting because this is Moscardo who's been talking all about body cells and people judging him based on his body self but how he doesn't really identify with the body self and he's different but yet he's in um i think he's in his house looking down on the yard he's describing these women in a way that's about their body self and not really kind of taking any recognition that they're different in their being self so it, it was it was ironic to have that description and it makes you kind of think well yeah, like, you, you want to be seen by people, you want them to know the real you, but you don't give other people the benefit of the doubt and see the real them, you judge them based on what they look like and their behaviours. So I thought that was really nicely done. Moscada also refers to human desire to be alone and suggests that this is because 
you know, it's not even that we just want to be alone. We're happy to be alone with lots of people in public around us. But what we don't want is to be in interaction with somebody. And the reason for that is because if we're alone or alone, but with people around us, but we're, we're just alone inside that, we're not focused on ourselves. It's like that deep feeling of relaxation that you don't have to think about yourself and who you are in relation to that other self and who you need to be in relation to that other self. You can just relax and be and not think about everything else that's external and constructed on you. And it's almost like we are performing a version of ourselves for others almost being what they've constructed of us sometimes there's a an example of Mascara's wife who constructs her own version of him um, and she calls him um, Genge I think it is and what she perceives as him is very different than how he perceives himself but that's the version that that she has created for him and he engages in that with her so wanting to be alone is wanting to just exist and live and I really resonated with that because I feel that a lot which also made me think about am I constructing a version of myself and I suppose I am because I cannot go into the world being my authentic self because whenever I have been it's been rejected because you have to be a publicly acceptable version of yourself. You have to sense yourself. You have to be nice to other people when you might not feel like being so. And so, you know, it is that performance, isn't it, to be socially acceptable. And there's also a comment about how every person is reconstructing their reality of you each time they have an experience with your body self and how you've behaved and acted and that that can just flip like as soon as you do one thing that's it they've got a whole new reality of how they perceive you based on that one behavior and yet you wouldn't think that was fair if that was done to you but yet you still do it to other people there's a little quote that says, anybody could take that body and turn it into the mascara he liked best. And so it's this nature of reality of when people like people or dislike people. It's not the actual person that they like or dislike, it's their version of reality of that person, which explains why the same person can be liked by some and disliked by others, because it's, you know, it's constructed and... It, You'd think that the reason why some people like the person and some people dislike them is because that person behaves differently with those two groups of people. But it might not even be that. It might literally just be that the realities are constructed differently and not even as groups because we're suggesting this is all completely individual. This is also reinforced in the book where Moscada talks about his disconnect with the name that he has and obviously his wife constructs this other name for him he doesn't really see himself as Moscada or as Genge like that's not what he labels himself as and this is really interesting to me because I've had this thought for a long time I'm called Sam full name Samantha I don't really identify with with my name when people say to me what do you prefer Sam or Samantha I'm like I'm not really bothered you can call me what you want you, it's very rare that you're going to have to directly address me and obviously in my relationship my partner has pet names for me so doesn't really call me by my first name and I almost identify more with the name that he's given me than my actual name because the name he's given to me has meaning in the context of our relationship I am that in our relationship Whereas my actual name, I've been named by my parents before they even knew me, before they even experienced what, what I was inside. And the body that I was has changed. So it's almost like I've got this name, but it's not got any significance other than to be a way of labelling myself to enable language with other people. So I find that really, really interesting because I've had that thought for a while. This is further explored as well to illustrate that we've got 
um, different interpretations of reality. So we often label things and those labels mean something to us, but that doesn't indicate a shared reality. So for example, we might, the other one in the book was, we might label and say something sky blue, but two different people's perceptions or experiences of the colour of sky blue are completely different. And I experience this with my partner because my partner's colour blind. And I, I try to have these conversations with him, but I don't think he really understands what I'm trying to say to him because he is colour blind, so he doesn't have that that experience like he doesn't have the experience of pink for example because he sees that as gray so often i'll put pink lipstick on and he'll think that i've got gray lipstick on or he buys a lot of pink stuff because he thinks that it's gray so he's got like pink charger leads and, and pink yoga mats because he when he bought them he thought they were great pink headphones over the one that he'd bought before and for him, he'll never experience the colour pink. Similarly, he can't see like Cadbury purple. And that's for me is like a favourite colour for me. It really has an impact on how I feel when I'm around that colour. He will never experience that. But his reality of that colour might have that same impact on him, but who knows? And it, it's difficult to kind of, you know, even though, you know, we all, even people that are not colourblind, people that can see colours, how I respond to a colour might be completely different to you because you might actually see it differently. You might experience that colour differently, but we don't know because we both label what we're seeing as that colour. And so I thought that that was really, really interesting. And uh, there's another example in the book as well where Moscada has a lodger. And this lodger, he's always walked past him and thought that he was a really nice guy. Always says morning, quite... Is it amiable? Amiable. And uh, and Moscada comments on how actually this guy has thought that he was an imbecile, even though Moscada thought that he was pleasant and you know they were having a nice interaction. And he gives an example of when the lodger complains about the smell of the horses, I think it's like smells of urine or something. And Moscada kind of has a, a recollection of a memory of his childhood and racing about in some kind of horse and cart thing and he smiles because he's remembering that but the perception from the lodger is that this guy's just looking at him and then smiling and obviously looks like an imbecile so his body's behaved in that way but inside he's having a whole different experience that hasn't been communicated between the two of them and how this might happen a lot like oftentimes my face is doing something that i'm not aware of because i'm having a different experience to what's going on in the world but that can be judged by other people in quite a negative way sometimes. And so it's almost like this. There's a comment in that, that section as well about how this guy, this logic, really doesn't like mosquito nets. But he actually, Moscato really likes mosquito nets because it reminds him of, of something, like another positive memory. And it's interesting how when somebody has an experience of something of the same object is experienced very differently by different people which indicates that they have a different perception of reality based on their own experiences and memories of things that have happened to them this is also further explored in the book where it talks a little bit about some furniture at someone's house and two friends and how one of them is basically saying that this chair is not aesthetically pleasing um Oh, it's just that you can comment on that. I think it comments about it. Does it? it, it the, one of the friends got a really negative view of the house. I think it's something about the the, the trees, the cypress trees, make it look like a graveyard. But the other friend really likes it. And the comment of the, of the furniture is that there's a chair that belongs to the person's late mother, and it's got memories imbued in it, which means that that has a a kind of anchoring in reality of it's important to that person but other people can't see that and can't see why that that chair would be important to that person almost like our preferences for things are not necessarily rooted in objective reality but are our own subjective reality based on our memories and our experiences so these different preferences are indicating different perceived realities is like support for what Parandello is suggesting and starkly, Pirandello comments that you, you will never truly be able to see 
anyone for who they really are objectively and to have them really see you so this feeling of not being seen and we often think that by meeting the one that will truly be seen by that person and our relationships often don't work out because that's impossible people do not have the ability to perceive you objectively how you really are they will always construct their own reality of who you are and will imbue that with their own interpretations memories experiences and that's quite existentially depressing isn't it but at the same time freeing because you don't need to search for it anymore because you, no one's ever going to do that for you you know you're always going to be alone in that and that perhaps you need to find a different version of connection because being unseen is quite normal it's interesting actually because that was a feeling that I had as a child I felt very unseen and I don't think actually now as an adult looking back at that 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 was anybody's fault I don't think that that was I mean perhaps you know my my parents could have engaged with me on a more emotional level perhaps but busyness of life often prevents that doesn't it and as an adult you know it's not it's not been solved and even in my relationship with my partner it's very obvious that we've got very different perceptions like when we try and when we like had a bit of a, a disagreement and we're trying to resolve it it's very obvious that my partner's on a completely different page to me and I at first was like like why doesn't he get it like is he stupid like what but actually it's not anything to do with that, it's to do with, you can't see something properly from someone's perspective, like even if they were to fully explain it to you, and your understanding of something, you need to explicitly explain it so that other person has even a, a modicum of chance of understanding your perspective. It's really made me understand actually being in a relationship with my partner, how important it is to explain things to people and to not assume that they know everything that I know because I know a lot of stuff. I assume everybody else does. But what I'm understanding is, you know, I'll make a joke that's very witty if you know what I'm talking about, but nobody gets it because they don't have that kind of background knowledge to get it. And it's like... I am really funny, but you wouldn't know because you need all that background information to be able to understand my jokes. Anyway. There's also a comment about how the reason why we have these, well, not, maybe not the reason, but maybe why it's important to have memories in objects or maybe why we attribute memories to objects is because it gives us this anchoring to our own reality you know if you have imagine your bedroom you've got things in your bedroom we like we collect ornaments and you know things that we put in our rooms it almost gives us a sense of reality because without those things who are we like where are our clues for who we are and our reality becomes a little bit unstable which is why when we like move house or when we go on traveling abroad or our concept of self really shifts and really changes and mutates and takes on new new things because or when we get rid of objects and get new objects like you know there is a subtle change there i feel so pirandello explores the nature of an unstable self which is constantly being reconstructed by our experiences the things that we go through and how as well that it's hampered by our memories of the past. If we didn't have those memories of the past, we might reconstruct a different version of ourselves, but we almost keep ourselves stuck in that. You know, there's a lot of therapeutic conversations about how if we got rid of the stories that we tell ourselves about ourselves, we could create a better life, life for ourselves. Like we could be anything that we want to be. You can reconstruct your own reality as much as you want. You can ignore everything that's happened before. I feel like for me, a lot of... It's almost like the very first time something happens to you, you're like, all right, that's the first time it happened. And when multiple things happen, where it's like a repeat, you then start to think that it's you and it's your fault. Um, 
and you start to think, oh, there must be something wrong with me and, and maybe I should look at that and work on that. But in reality, it's just that same thing that's quite common that's happening a lot. And so there isn't anything wrong with you and there's not anything that you need to work on or fix. And do you know what? I'm having so many examples of where this has played out in my life. And I'll give you one that's not exposing to me because I've talked about this a lot on other videos is that when I was dating a lot, I couldn't find anybody that I found physically attractive and that I connected with on a mental level and that was a nice person. It was either one of those or none of those. And, you know, I was dating people that I wasn't attracted to physically and mentally because I was, like, giving them a chance, you know, because I was too fussy. And obviously that didn't work. And when I met my partner, I realised there's nothing wrong with me. Like, I am attracted to my partner, which is enough for me. And other people are attracted to me. And I can completely see that now. Um where I couldn't see that before because I thought that I was ugly. I thought that there was something wrong with me and all kinds of things. And it, it's ridiculous because the statistics are that there's going to be lots of people that find you attractive if you're an average looking person because there's lots of average looking people, you know. And if you are above average looking, then everyone's going to be fancying you. You know, it's just kind of the way it is. And even if you are unattractive, there are lots of unattractive people that will also find you attractive because you've got somebody similar looking into you. Um, and I'm using these labels just as like, you know, societally imposed labels. I'm not suggesting that, that you know, that people are unattractive because beauty is in the eye of the beholder, you know, isn't it? Like I think that my partner's gorgeous, but I imagine other people don't view him and think, the same thing and, and vice versa with me as well so that was kind of one thing and also what I realised was there was nothing wrong with my personality like I wasn't too blunt I wasn't too uh, direct with people I wasn't too intimidating because of my intelligence I wasn't um, I don't know loads of different things because my partner absolutely adores me and so these kind of stories that I was telling myself as meaning that I was feeling bad about myself and maybe showing up in the world in a different way so that I wasn't attracting kind of what I was looking for and so yeah I've gone off on a tangent but essentially these memories of ourselves they hold us back from reconstructing this this new kind of self that might be better and this also explains like the change in preference in friends that we have like if we're always reconstructing ourselves and we're always kind of changing and it's funny actually because when you ask people like oh have you changed like some people truly believe that they've not changed that they have no self-awareness that they've actually changed as a person and they view things differently and whatever i'm hyper aware of it and i think things like these videos are really useful for me because when i look back at years past when i've done a video i'm like oh wow like my thoughts have changed completely since that video or you know the things that I'm talking about oh that's really different now and I just noticed that I'm very different day by day and think because I expose myself to lots of things all the time they have a massive impact on how I'm evolving as a person and becoming you know a better more enlightened kind of version of myself and so the friends that I might have had at one point in my life they don't they don't vibe with me in the same way as I'm changing. You know, you you meet with someone in an intellectual way, but then if you're evolving and they're not, then the intellectual meeting of mind is not there anymore. Similarly, your life changes if you decide not to drink anymore and they drink all the time, that's a value that's changed for you. You know, what are you, what are your friends for? because if you only ever drank with them and there was no connection there anyway then what were your friends for you were friends to go out and have a good time but there's no there's no connection there there's no kind of like friendship really there it was a very superficial kind of friendship really you know if everyone's too drunk to remember what's happened is that really connection it's not is it Uh, Pirandello also uses uh, metaphors such as stones from a mountain and trees into cabinets to kind of get you thinking about when there's a mountain and the stones are taken from the mountain, are those stones still the mountain? And when does the mountain not become a mountain when the stones are removed or the trees 
becoming cabinets and cabinets still the tree or has it become it was kind of question that that of evolution of self and how it can transmute into something else and is that the same self or is that reconstructed into something different so the tree becoming the cabinet it's something different but is it the original tree I find that quite interesting to explore he also discusses how we create different versions of ourselves for different people for example if you're a parent the self that you are for your child is not the self that you are when you're around your friends or when you're around your parent or how you are when you're at work you know we create these different selves and I suppose this feeds back into what we were talking about before of that need to be alone and to not perform and to just be your actual living being rather than this kind of creation of who you are in these different contexts for these different people that are creating these different realities of you and it's interesting as well how you know I talked about like my child just a little tiny bit that was my reality, my constructed reality of my childhood, which is very different to my siblings' reality of the environment or my parents' reality of the environment. I've had conversations with my brother before about a shared experience, and it was a very different version of what happened to what I had in my mind. And I imagine it's a very different version to what my parents had in their mind. So it's interesting, isn't it? This perception of reality. And then Pirandello also talks a little bit about the madness of society and how society is a, um, a mind-constructed concept and that it's your mind that's creating external pressure and stress and these responsibilities that you've got to do that all prevent us from being alive. And I feel a lot like in my recent life, work has taken a big part of my life because it's so busy and so demanding and it's interesting because there's always I mean you know I'm talking about work but even just my life like it's got to the point where I have so many things that I have to do life admin work admin on a day-to-day -day basis that I feel very much like I'm just getting through the to-do list every day I've got a to-do list at work I've got a to-do list at home it's just getting through that you know I've got chores I've got this to sort out that to sort out you know a holiday planning becomes a to-do you know situation instead of an enjoyable experience and you don't ever kind of like get to just live and enjoy life and do the things that you enjoy because you don't make time for them you don't make time for the things that are important to you because you're too busy doing the things that you think you should be doing because of all that external pressure. It's interesting, I started to think about work recently in that I am a middle reader and I have a couple of staff that I might direct to do things and then I have like people above me that push a lot of work onto me to do. It's deadlined. There's that external pressure. But I have a responsibility as a leader to improve my staff and department but what tends to happen is because of all that external thing coming from above I never have any time to do my job because I'm always doing the stuff that they're asking me to do so there's no like space to do what I actually need to do that I know that I need to get done because it's not deadline it's not a priority but it is a priority like it's an essential priority because if I was doing that the top stuff wouldn't be coming down because it would be sorted so I'm finding that that external pressure is, it must be created in my mind that I need to listen to them instead of doing what I need to do. You know, I'm not valuing my own integrity and my own judgment because I'm assuming someone above me knows more than I do. And they don't. Like, they obviously have different experiences and different, you know, experiences. And of course, they're experienced, but they're not in my department and they don't know what's going on there and they don't know what needs to be done because they're not reading things like I'm reading and taking part in professional development. I have the answers and I can do these things, but I'm not giving myself the time to do them because I'm prioritising other people's work when they should be doing that, you know, or they should be doing more of that or directing that in a different way. And so, you know, because there's not an acknowledgement there that there isn't time to do both things. And so I need to draw the line and put the boundaries in place and be like, I can't meet your deadlines because I need to do my own job. And the reason I'm not this, I'm not more successful at my job is because you keep stopping me from doing my job. So it's something that I've been really kind of thinking about recently that I need to do more of. I need to put, you know, I need to say no to things more and be like, that's not possible at the time that you've given me because of all these other things that I actually have to do. 
Uh, but anyway, that's something to maybe report back on another time. He discusses this madness in society of trying to find meaning, but that inadvertently takes you away from just living because you're seeking something rather than just existing and, you know, enjoying life. Like, it's another to-do thing, isn't it? Another thing to kind of find and solve. And there's also a discussion about how the feeling of peace is constructed in the mind in the same way. So you can construct stress, you can construct peace, and you're in control of that. Like, you know, yeah, there's stuff out externally, but really, like, you get to choose how you respond to what's coming your way. You don't have to do what people are asking you to do. You can refuse, you can, you know, you can find another way around things. Uh, there was um, a situation that I was in a couple of months ago where, probably like a year ago actually, where I had a letting agent and they would constantly email me about things. And if I didn't email them back straight away, they'd start ringing my phone and leaving voicemails. And it was harassment. It was harassment. And it got to the point like I was wanting to respond and feeling like I had to respond and it wasn't convenient for me to respond which is why I hadn't and uh, you know it was my mind was creating that stress because I could have just ignored it and just gone no nah. but I didn't and so you know that was interesting I found that as quite a spiritual practice for me in that I do respond negatively to external demands in a way that I feel quite stressed about it but it is just a construction of my own mind rather than a self you know like a, an externally imposed it's a self-imposed thing he also mocks um Pirandello I keep looking on the to see how to pronounce it <laughs> also mocks the idea that we've solved all our problems with industry and technology it's like oh we've got all these things and we've solved all these problems and yet all we're doing is masking our problems and thinking that we've got everything solved and we're doing really well but as soon as we hit a time of distress everything comes back up and we question the nature of our reality again and we're quite unstable in it then that's quite interesting because you know you can think you've solved everything you've got all of your life sorted and then you have a mental breakdown and it's always at that point and you start to realize oh actually you know there's loads of stuff that i've not dealt with because i've been repressing everything thinking that that was the way to get through life you know, not, you know, thinking, oh, that's not really a problem, that's illogical, but not actually acknowledging those, you know, and validating those feelings that you're having in response to, you know, a very real situation that's caused them. There's also a little bit of reference to middle class ignorance um, of the poor in that it was almost like a comment of only the middle class have got the luxury of being insane and mad because the poor don't have time for mental health issues you know they've got to work and feed themselves and I find that quite interesting um, particularly if you think of like the history of Freud and um, women's hysteria which is a very middle class problem there's also a comment about how if you are really living and enjoying life and being you know yourself then you haven't got the time to be looking at yourself. You don't think about yourself. You don't focus on yourself. You're very outward looking rather than inward looking. And that made me think a lot about the detriment of social media and how it's made everybody focus inwards instead of outwards. And this is what's causing a lot of like mental health issues because the focus, the hyper focus, the con self-consciousness is on the self instead of, you know, the, the times where you feel the most alive and the most happy are when you forget yourself, when you don't even think of your existence. So the comment before about when you're truly alone um, in the throes of orgasm, when you're in flow, all of these kind of situations like when you're playing um, like a sports game where there's a high level of skill required, anything like that, you know, even being drunk, you know, the reason why that's so attractive to people is because you forget yourself. So any kind of experiences where you're forgetting yourself is, is where mental wellness is. And so ultimately, you know, this, this book is great because it's such a thought-provoking read. I've only been talking to you for 45 minutes about it. And it's so interesting to me that 
this writer is writing about things that that I've thought about, you know, in various different situations, and it kind of just amalgamates them into one nice book to read. I really enjoyed just hearing the kind of thoughts that were coming through and jumping off the page at me. I kind of really, really resonated with them. I'm very interested to find out what Myers Briggs uh, Pirandello's got because I wonder if it's similar to mine, and that's why we're vibing. Um, and I'm very, very interested to find out what people from my book club thought. And actually, there's I put it on meetups. It's quite open to a lot of people who we've not met before. So it'll be interesting to hear what what other people think of it because because I found it great. But I wonder if that's because I'm very interested in the nature of self and reality and you know my subject psychology and I find that fascinating. And I wonder if I've got a bias towards it for that reason. And as I mentioned before, it's not a fantastic read in terms of like you know literary fiction. But it doesn't need to be because it's got so much else in it. You know, you're getting more non-fiction out of it really than fiction. So yeah, I'd recommend it. I'd say that it was worth a read just to challenge your kind of perspectives on things. And I think if you listen to you and you're thinking, God, what she's talking about, uh, is she mad? Then maybe, you know, it's worth reading because it's a different perspective. And if you have been thinking these things for a while and thought that you were alone, it, it's worth reading for that reason because it's quite comforting to know that this is something that we all experience, or at least some of us do, <laughs> if that's if that is also the case. So yeah, I'll be interested to to find out what you think and if you, you know, have read the book or if you're interested in reading the book or uh, what your perspectives on it on it are because I think it's a type of book that that would be interesting to kind of find that out. So yeah, see you later.